Hi, hello everyone. Thank you for your patience. We're about to start our Committee on Energy, Economic Development, and Tourism for our 3 o'clock agenda in room 224 at the Capitol. Excuse me, but I have to have uh, some housekeeping notations mentioned here. This meeting, including the audio and video of the remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. If you find links to viewing options, you can find links to viewing options on all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislative website. So if at 2 o'clock in the morning you're bored, you can watch uh, Bonnet and myself all night, every night, forever. We will live on YouTube. In the unlikely event that we are, have uh, abrupt technical difficulties, we run into turbulence or airbags are deployed, the committee will reconvene this discussion of any outstanding business and we will do so on February 8th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon here in room 224. And for all the participants uh, uh, testifying remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until shortly before it's your turn to testify. And also, because we have so much testimony and such a limited period of time here today, we are going to limit every individual's testimony to 30 seconds. And we have a timer here, so you're going to hear an <coughs> irritating sound. That's not my voice. That's going to be the indication that you are over 30 seconds and unfortunately I'm going to have to cut you off uh, just so we can keep this hearing moving in a timely fashion. So with all of that said, I just want to introduce, um, I'm here with uh, Vice Chair Senator Misalucha and online we have Senator Favela and we have Senator Revere. We will move now into our first bill, that is Senate Bill 929 relating to renewable energy. First in our testifiers list is Scott Glenn from the Energy Office. Aloha, Chair, members of the committee. The Energy Office stands on our submitted testimony offering comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glenn. Uh, Jay Griffin from the PUC. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. We have our written testimony. I just want to highlight a couple of things given the short time. I uh, just want to really focus on imposing a timeline on our PPA decisions. It's not going to be a fix for the more complex, complicated decisions and projects that come before us. I highlight um, we've had rate case decisions before where when, they're in, uh, uh, when there's a timeline imposed on them, we've had to send uh, those companies back uh, to dismiss and resubmit their applications. On uh, some of our other procedures, really the, the projects that have taken longer uh, have to do with assuring that we have due process for all the participants. So with that, um, I will uh, be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Dean Nishina from DCCA. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. You have our written testimony offering comments and uh, stand on that testimony and available for questions, if any. Great. Thank you, Mr. Nishino. Greg Shimokawa from Hawaii Electric. Hi, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm testifying on behalf of Hawaii Electric Company, respectfully in opposition to SB 929. Just. Um, I want to highlight a few points from our written testimony, just that there are unintended consequences of imposing these kinds of um, strict timelines as proposed in the bill. And the other thing just to mention or to highlight is, is that there are uh, numerous parties involved in, in this interconnection process and who are um, required to, to work together to make it a success. And um, it's, it's not just the company, it's not just the commission. There, there are lots of you know, interested stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shimokawa. Michael Munakata from Ulupono has submitted commentary, and Frederick Rydell from Clean Power Alliance also or ha has submitted testimony in support. Uh, members, any questions of those who are online with us today? I, ha I have a couple of questions. One first for uh, Jay Griffith from the PUC. Your chair. I read your testimony. I understand that um, you know there there are situations where uh, the the t shot clock might be hurtful to the end result. But in your testimony, you talked about um, how you tried to expedite and have more recently been much better at getting uh, projects approved. But one part that I didn't quite understand was where you. There have been decisions that have taken almost two years to, for you to approve, and they have still gone under appeals. And at the same time, you mentioned that there, 
uh, there have been really good projects where you have uh, approved them within three months and they have not been appealed. So just because they help, help me understand that you have, you have like these very lengthy, long delays for the, for the PUC approval and they still get appeals and you've had really quick approvals and they've had no appeals. So help me reconcile why the shot clock uh, doesn't work under those circumstances. Sure, I'm going to try my best with this, um, Senator Chair. I think probably my first response to that is, uh, right, these are not all one size fit all. Not not every project is similar. So, one, you know, and the reason I'm going to be a little careful is the the project you're referring to that took about two years. It was recently appealed, uh, so it's an active case before the Supreme Court. Um, we have a range of people that may seek to intervene in these cases. Um, in these cases, they've been asserting their constitutional rights. And in those cases, we, we've enacted contested case procedures and it takes time. Um, and so I think what is accurate is that it doesn't necessarily guarantee that uh, that party will not appeal. But what the commission has done is laid a clear track record and afforded due process. So when that case goes up on appeal, um, we'll see what the, the eventual outcome is. That may, if hopefully that makes sense. Okay, well, yeah. It does, it doesn't quell my desire to kind of still put the shot clock on you because it doesn't seem like just be whatever the, right now for the PUC it's six months, that that will lead to more appeals or less appeals? Sure, uh, Senator, maybe, actually that's a better angle to approach from. Let's, let's take, we have a six month shot clock. We have a number of groups that ask for a contested case. Uh, first, there's a 20 day timeline uh, window, for, window, window for intervention. Uh, so by the time we make a decision on that, that's one month down. We need to take all of the written testimony uh, prior to holding an evidentiary hearing, allow for parties to submit their statements of position, rebuttal, um, have uh, discovery on that record prior to us even holding the hearing. Uh, our hearing for the most recent case took two days. That took weeks and weeks of preparation. It takes uh, time for the, the full evidentiary record, to be, the recorded record, uh, to be transcribed and sent back to the commission. And so I think what I'm trying to lay out is that six month clock is going to run out in that time frame. So we're, we're probably going to have to make a decision without having run through all those steps, which has a higher probability of not just being appealed, but being remanded back to the commission for further proceedings. Um, or we're just going to have to most likely, or in, in a case like we've had to do with rape cases, um, we've had to dismiss the application and have them fix any defects in it and then come back to the commission later. And so that's not typical, but we've had that happen in a few cases with some of our rate cases where we didn't have all the information we needed at the outset. Okay, thank you, Mr. Griffin. I have a question for um, uh, Hiko and Mr. Shimokawa. And so, Mr. Shimokawa, I understand why you don't want to have a shot clock put on Hiko, uh, but we, we really need to get these projects online sooner rather than later. and. I understand that there could be circumstances in which the developer has made some decisions that will delay the project going online. Can I put in language here that says that uh, the shot clock will still be on you, but if there's mutual agreement between HECO and the developer for whatever community input, you want to take a little bit of more time, that that would be something that you could live with if we have it where it's mutually agreed upon by yourself and the developer for delay to go beyond the uh, for you, it's nine months shot clock. Well, I think we want to validate that, you know, we are, it is in everybody's interest and in our interest to move these, these forward um, as quickly as we can. Um, I, I think um, bringing the developer into that and to have them be a part of this process and, and be accountable is is something that we don't, we're interested in doing. But I, I think you know, what you described here um, I, I'm not sure if it accounts for a situation where the developers you know, may not agree about the delay and about, you know, there, there may not be an agreement between the utility and the developers about the reasons for, for the change and the reason and the need 
for the, the shot clock, so to speak, to stop. Yeah, well, I'm trying to provide an out for you, right? Because if it's no fault of your own and the developer, for whatever reason, is delaying, then you shouldn't be penalized with the shot clock. But absent that, I want to put the onus on you and HECO to, I mean, get these projects as quickly as possible online so we get more renewables on, on, on the, the grid. So, because I mean, there's, there's no compulsion for the developer to, like, not give you information or withhold things, right? Because that's only going to hurt themselves. So the, really, the gatekeeper is you, uh, not so much the developer. So I'm trying to figure out how we can make this so it's, it's not totally disadvantageous to you, but at the same time, we're gonna hold your feet to the fire and make you put these projects out quicker rather than later. So. Sure, well, maybe, maybe an example I can use it is, you know, sometimes developers have other reasons for, for, for doing things that cause delays. There may be business decisions to, to make changes to you know, equipment or other kinds of things that you know ultimately you know, affect the timeline that or you know the utility shot clock, and there are things that have you know we'll have to restart the studies or re significantly impact that timing, and so you know we could not agree and get stuck with the original timeline. So there, there are things I think that um, are, are not completely aligned, I guess, with that. Um, mm -hmm. that approach but you know again in general we are in support of trying to move things faster and more efficiently i think you know we we have made improvements in working together with the parties and, and the commission to, to do those things and um, okay thank you members any questions of those who are online okay no okay thank you mr shimakawa we're going to move on to our next bill that is senate bill 930 Relating to renewable energy, first on our testifiers list is Scott Glenn from the Energy Office. Well, hello, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the office stands on submitted testimony offering comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glenn. Uh, Jay Griffin from the PUC. Stand on our written testimony offering comments and available for any questions also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Uh, Dean Nishino from DCCA. Good afternoon. Uh, we stand on our written testimony offering comments available for questions. Thank you, Dean. Greg Shimokawa from HECO. I just want a small point to add to our testimony, just to, to highlight that, you know, adding another layer does, does add the potential for adding time and cost to the process. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Shimokawa. And we have uh, Frederick Riddell from Clean Power Alliance has submitted testimony support. Robert Huber. Testify for the Democratic Caucus Environmental Committee has submitted testimony in support. Members, any questions for the four gentlemen we have online? No. No? Okay. I have one question for Jay Griffith. Jay, you mentioned in your testimony um, that if if we were to mandate you ha have this hero, this um, energy, uh, what is the proper? Hawaii Energy Electric Reliability Administrator. Yes, that's the person. Yes. So essentially a, a traffic cop, right, to move uh, projects along uh, hopefully sooner rather than, than, than later. That having the cost for HERA will be borne by the rate payers. So that was one reason why you were against this particular bill. But there is nothing in this in the language that says that that has to happen. That the bill actually talks that you may provide a surcharge. Correct. Uh, respectfully, Chair, if you look at um, page eight, this is section four, uh, section two sixty nine one forty six. The way it currently reads is may. Um, the bill would say the commission shall require by rule of order that all utilities, persons, businesses, or entities connecting to the Y electric system or any other user shall pay a surcharge. So by that section in particular, the may to shall would require us, particularly the persons and businesses, we interpret that to be all customers. Okay, so if I were to just keep it as may, that would allow you to have the developers be the ones to bear the cost of paying for the this HERA uh, contractor, correct? It's where we've been. I, the, 
Yes, the clause here has an or for developers. In the beginning, we interpret all, I mean, it says businesses, persons or businesses. Um, okay. I just want to make sure that I mean, if we have someone who's going to be the traffic cop to move projects along, I don't want the rate payers to have to pay for that. I think that HECO and the developer should pay for this person or this contractor. Um, so I think I might make that change. Okay, um, members, any questions of those who are on line for Senate Bill 930? Yeah, right, Chair, this oh. is Gil Rivier. Yeah. I've got a question sure. for uh, UC. Sure. So, so Senator. if Aloha. So if the, um, if it were structured so that it, this legislation clarified that the developers shall pay, um, does that work? I mean, can that be done? Or is it ultimately going to get passed on to the ratepayers anyway? I think fundamentally the answer is correct. That, that it will get, I mean, they'll factor it into the cost of the power purchase agreements. Um, which are then passed on through the, what we assess on customer bills. So I, I, the, I think, I mean, they're, that they're going to look to recover, or I think prospectively into the future, knowing this change is there. So they'll build it into the, they'll build it in somewhere. They'll build Probably. it in a clock somewhere. I mean, I, I can't, I'm not going to speak on, I think that maybe there's the um, Clean Power Association may be in a better position, but I don't think they're going to eat that as part of their return on the project would be my speculation. I think so in, in, the, in the spirit of trying to come up with a uh, process to expedite this and have somebody overseeing it, um, is there an alternative way that's not being done now um, that you, it sounds like you're a little uh, uncertain about this option. Is there an alternative way that you would suggest might uh, achieve the same goals that the, this measure tries to set forth? Well, when I offer Senator and Chair, members of the committee, I mean, the commission has been working diligently on trying to get these projects online. Now, I mean, I think everyone is concerned and not happy about the outcome with the phase one project, seeing the, uh, the delays. Um, so having, I think, I mean, what we've been working on is improvements to that for the next round of projects. We have our independent observers overseeing these different processes further investigating um, and working to bring projects online sooner. So we've we have tried to use the tools available to us to bring these online um, in a more timely manner. Is this another tool though that helps helps you expedite um, in the big picture? In or the big it picture, a... it could be. What I want to be clear on is that it, it will still take time for the commission to set this up. We would need to hire somebody um to fill this role so it's it's not a quick fix necessarily but over the long term i, I mean i think we've we've always looked to this and tried to figure out when the right time may be to uh take you know the step of higher i mean having this additional capacity to help okay thank you thank you chair sure members any further questions i'm good sorry just have a, a comment so you know jay from a lawmaking perspective, all we have to go on is what you've achieved. And to be honest, what you've achieved is not in very timely. I mean, for projects to be sitting there for two years and not be approved is the reason why we have this bill and the, and the previous bill. So I understand that you're trying your best to make it better, but the results just are not there yet. So that's why we, we're, we're putting together some kind of mechanism in which for you to really hasten the approval, not just you, but HECO as well, to hasten approval of, of these processes. And going back to the, who's gonna pay for this, uh, although you cited language in the bill, it's really actually in statute already in section 269-146D as a dog that uh, allows you to put the cost of this hair uh, contractor on the uh, HECO or, the, or the, uh, the developer, not on the rate pair, so that, that out already exists for you uh, in, in statute already. So there's no Senator, may I have an opportunity to respond? Sure. You're citing one project. That was one project out of eight in the first round. The rest of those were approved expeditiously. Um, we're working on the, the next round of projects. We've done the first three in three months on top of all the other work that our commission's doing. So 
when you when you talk about our track record, I just ask you to look at the whole track record, not one project in, the, in particular. Okay. The reason that we, we you're correct that on the on the surcharge question, we have had this capability, and I think it speaks to the question from Senator Revere. We have we have not used it because that cost will be passed on in one form or another, and we've been reluctant to do that. So, but if the legislature, if the desire here is that we shall initiate creating this administrator, then we will take the steps of setting up the cost and the structure. Okay, and you're, you're right, Jay, it's not, it's not entirely the PUC's fault. I think part of the blame is also on HECO, so you're not wholly responsible for some of these delays. It's HECO as well. That's why these bills are just both your responsibility as well as uh, HECO's responsibilities. Members, any further questions? If not, we're going to go on to our third bill. That is Senate Bill 931, relating to renewable energy. First on our testifiers list for this measure is Scott Glenn from the Energy Office. Aloha, Chair, members of the committee. The Energy Office stands on its uh, submitted testimony, offering comments and available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glenn. Uh, Dean Nishina, DCCA. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, we stand on our written testimony available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nishino. Uh, Jay Griffith from the PUC. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we stand on our written testimony offering comments also and available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. Mark Asano from Hawaii, Hawaiian Electric. Uh, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee. Just wanted to offer a few additional comments. Um, you know, uh, the bill as currently written uh, would pre would, wouldn't would allow us to, you know, maintain our um, conventional generating units that currently burn fossil that could be converted at a later date, uh, you know, to, to um, use renewable fuels, um, as well as convert um, existing generating units to be able to provide, um, for example, like synchronous condensers, which um, allows us to repurpose um, generating units to uh, provide some stability services. Um, you know, additionally, um, you know, when I kind of think Mr. about Sano. resilience for the state and Mr. the Sano. national sort of defense infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Asano. Sorry, we, we have a 30 second time limit for everyone to speak, but uh, we have your Kiko's testimony as well. David Bissell from the Kauai Utility Cooperative has submitted te testimony in opposition. Leroy Chisino, Chisio, excuse me, from IBEW. I don't know if Leo is here. Hi. Oh, yes, there you are. Hi. Hi, Leo. Hi, Adam Crescent for Leroy. Yeah, thank you, Chair and committee members. Uh, we stand in our submitted testimony and are open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. Uh, Sandy Wong for Tesla. Yes, thank you, Chair Wakai. Um, Tesla supports this chest, um, this bill. Uh, we do have one friendly amendment because of current technology and we are unsure when this bill would become effective because the date is blanked out. We would ask that grid tied battery energy storage be removed from this bill. And I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Frederick Rydell from Hawaii Clean Power Alliance has submitted testimony support. Sherry Pollock from 350 Hawaii in support. Ted Bolin from Climate Protectors Coalition in support. And we have three other individuals, actually four individuals, all in support. Members, any questions of those who we have online? No? No? Oh, Senator Favela? Oh, no. Okay, sorry, you're, you're muted. Um, I have a couple of questions from, uh, or I'll start off with uh, you, Sandy, from Tesla. Yes, sir. So, Sandy, I understand how, I'm trying to understand why batteries would be against this measure. Is it my understanding that with the batteries that you might sell to, to HECO, that you want the opportunity for your batteries to be run on fossil fuels? Right now, we need some fossil fuels to, to use it, to run on it. Um, also, currently, because there is a mix on the grid of both renewables and um, fossil fuel generators, that if we're storing energy, 
we don't know if that energy is coming from fossil fuel or renewable generator. So right now, unfortunately, the technology is just not there. Uh, we definitely think that the batteries helps us increase the use of renewable, gen uh, renewable energy. But right now, there are some fossil fuel generated energy that will come into the battery. And so that is a problem for us, especially since that um, the date is left blank. You know, if, if we could be certain of, let's say, if you put in 2045, we might be more comfortable. But if you were going to put in 2022, we don't think the technology would be there. Yeah, but if we put in 2020, I mean, 2045, then, I mean, it's obvious that by that time, we're supposed to be 100% renewable. What this bill contemplates is trying to get HECO off fossil fuels in a methodical way as they ramp up uh, renewables. What, what the legislature doesn't want to see is HECO spending money to refurbish and extend the life of their fossil fuel plants in, in the future. So, um, yeah, I know, I know the date is a big thing, right? If we make it next year, it's going to be problematic. If we make it 2045, then no sense for this bill. How about 2035? 35, or maybe an example is that, um, that you know, you might say that there has to be a percentage on how much fossil fuel can be used for the battery. Um, that might be helpful. Um, I don't know the exact percentage. I could get you that number, but right now I can't say that um, the batteries will, are, are running on 100% renewable. And, and in regards to your comment of wanting to get HECO off fossil fuels and going to renewable, Tesla agrees with you 110%. Wow, that's more than your battery charge. <laughs> okay. okay, so 10% is from Sandy. Oh, okay, yeah, you are quite the dynamo, Sandy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question for HECO. Sorry, the gentleman's name was Mark. Mark Osama? Uh, so, Mark, sorry, I had to cut you off a little bit earlier, but the question I have for you and, and Hiko is that I understand that you have to do some repair and maintenance now. I mean, it's not like you're going to flip the switch and then in the next year you're going to all be on, on renewables. So I understand the necessity for you to have some mechanism to uh, maintain and repair. Is it okay for you if we set kind of a threshold that Anything that's under $2.5 million of, a, of a investment by HECO, uh, you, can, you can do that. But anything above $2.5 million in, in investing into your fossil fuel plants will not be allowed. Is that something that you can live with? I, I think we'd still have concerns. There are um, certain occasions where you know there may be major um, improvements that need to be made just to be able to keep the unit running. Um, and, you know, depending on what that date is, you know, we do need to be able to have um, sources of generation available, especially when the wind's not blowing or the, the sun's not shining. Um, so, you know, we, we, we do look at, um, you know, not putting too much investment into uh, assets that may be retired in the future, but um, there, there, may, there will be times when, you know, such uh, investment is necessary to just keep the, uh, the generator goal. Yeah, but see, that's what makes me pause, is you're going to invest in major improvements for your current generating capacity. I mean, I've been to your Schofield plant where it's run either by diesel or biofuels. So I can see where, if, okay, if you're going to make a major in improvement or investment, you would go ahead and invest in something like that, which wouldn't be prohibited under this bill. So if you were to go build a new biofuels plant, then go at it. But to say that you want to keep it open for potential major improvements of existing generation capacity, to me, I don't think that's going in the right direction. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, there are occasions too where, you know, infrastructure can be repurposed or used um, you know, to either burn uh, renewable sources of fuel or even to repurpose that asset um, for other uses, um, you know, which would require, um, you know, some maintenance and investment in those to keep those units running. Okay, I can see. 
he goes holding on to what you have. I think we have, I think there's a public interest in us kind of prying your fingers off of the current business model and really pushing you to embrace renewables and stop putting money into old uh, economic or power generation opportunities. Um, members, any further questions of those who are online? Chair, uh, this is Gil, oh, Riviere. Was, was KIAC online or do they just have written testimony? Uh, they only had written testimony. Okay, uh, back to Hawaiian Electric then, please. Yes, that's Mark Asano. Yeah. I Hi, think. Senator. Okay. Great, thank you. So um, there are times, I, I understand the hardest, well, besides the redundancy and the stability of the, of the grid, there are times, as you mentioned, where it's cloudy and not windy and and there's issues. So how, what is the plan for addressing peak load and surges and unexpected shortfalls? Um, I imagine that you, there, there has to be some sort of generator kind of on demand system. So I'm just wondering what is the long range plan for Hawaiian Electric to address those things? Um, and is that part of the reason for the objection to this, this measure? We, you know, we, we are closely looking at uh, resilience right now. Um, we do have an integrated resource or integrated grid planning uh, proceeding uh, with the commission, in front of the commission, with other stakeholders. Uh, you know, we do feel like based on, you know, the current available technologies today, um, you know, when the, when the weather conditions aren't prime for renewables, you are going to need um, a source of generation that can provide um, energy to the customers uh, during those times. Um, and so, you know, we, um, you know, right now we view whether, whether the, the generator may be um, using alternative fuels or fossil fuel, you know, prior to 2045, you know, I think it is important for the reliability purposes, you know, to ensure that we don't have rolling blackouts to be able to um, supply that, meet that demand from customers. Um, so, the, so the plan resources. is, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the plan is yeah. to not have any oil fired backup or anything for redundancy by 2045? Is, is that so? I think, so renewables and using things like battery energy storage would always be the first option, um, but you know. But even then, I guess even then you need some flexibility right. uh, to, to, to generate electricity when needed. So yes, it's not necessarily 2045 that uh, there's, there's zero possibility of fossil fuel generation. I mean, you, there's still a plan to have that as a, as a reserve. Is that safe to say? Yeah, so I mean, even after 2045, we, we need to look at um, maybe the same technology, but different fuel source, right? It, it may not be fossil fuels. So back to a question the chair just asked um, uh, a moment ago uh, was, is there a way to phase this in to scale it back? Say, okay, you can't use any more than th this much. I mean, because this is a different question than the goal of 100% renewable energy, right? This is, this is a slightly different question. Right. I, I think it'd be prudent to do um, additional analysis to specifically look at that issue. Um, and, you know, we do need to look at um, resilience, um, you know, in, you know, if there are a natural disaster or consecutive days of prolonged bad weather, you know, what, what it would take to, to continue to reliably serve the customers. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Senator Lee. Well, thanks very much. Um, and this is also for Hiko. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time this afternoon. You know, I think, um, Based on the, the conversation we've been having about making, and some of the concerns raised about making investments in infrastructure that may not make sense in the long term, especially if it's significant amounts of money and millions of dollars and all that, um, you know, we're seeing around the world the situation change very rapidly where there have been uh, plants that were planned and designed and then built, and you know, five years later, by the time they open, um, whether they're a gas plant or certainly new coal plants and, and others of that sort, they're already. Um, completely underwater, and they just can't produce the power that is going to pay off the, the financing that was invested in the first place. And so ratepayers are basically left on the hook. And you know, here in Hawaii, obviously, the situation is changing very rapidly, and the cost of energy is coming down. 
as recently as a couple of years ago, I know there were still discussions going on about potentially building all new fossil fuel plants, uh, not just repairing and maintaining, but building entirely new ones to add additional capacity. Is that something that's still on the table? Or I think, as some of the discussion had suggested, could HECO live with um, a cut up saying, all right, you can, you can invest in and maintain what you have, but certainly don't make new investments in whole new plants and whole new infrastructure? Yeah, so um, with, uh, as I was just discussing with Senator Revere, um, we are in the middle of uh, um, an integrated resource planning proceeding, and those are, I think, the types of issues that we would look at. I think the phasing out should be uh, carefully examined and evaluated, but, you know, sort of, if you want to call it this, but the, the minimum amount of, um, you know, non wind and solar type of sources of generation you would need to continue reliably serving uh, customers. Um, you know, I, I think um, folks do recognize that, you know, we can't solely rely on just wind and solar, you know, every hour of the year. Um, so there's times where we may need to have um, another generating source to be able to provide that um, energy. Sure, and Char, if I could just follow up just on that with uh, sure. one question. You know, in other places where I think there was an IRP process or some sort of, you know, equivalent, um, looking at what the grid needs are sort of on the whole and figuring out where, if it's a peaker plant that's being built or some sort of other capacity, um, that there is sort of a, a modern alternatives analysis looked at that isn't just driven, I think, in the same traditional way because it tends to favor just doing more of the same, but rather, um, look at, you know, Brooklyn's a great example, or New York's a great example, where Con Ed, for example, had, you know, they're going to spend over a billion dollars adding in new uh, upgrades in the community and then sort of rethought it with an independent anal grid analysis um, that found that, you know, they could do it for um, hundreds of millions of dollars and save almost a billion dollars on the cost. Is that sort of process and that sort of analysis that is somewhat independent from perhaps um, the revenue question for the utility? Um, in the works in this current process, this current IRP process, or is that something that the PBR process that the PUC, you know, just recently started getting into um, is going to change in the next year or two? Yeah, so we've been, um, that's a good question, Senator. We've been working on that um, for the past uh, year or two, and that is part of the current process to, um, I guess the industry term is not allowed as alternatives uh, to look at that. Um, so we do evaluate whether there are alternatives to um, traditional infrastructure. Um, and certainly the recent uh, performance-based regulation decision that the commission issued um, certainly incentivizes the companies to, to look in that direction as well. Um, so that is certainly part of the, the ongoing process. Sure, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Sorry, Mr. Hassan, I just had a couple of comments and a, and a question. Did I hear you correctly saying that it's HECO's plan to have fossil fuel burning generation capabilities after 2045? Oh, uh, no, uh, no, Chair. Um, uh, just to clarify, uh, I, what I was uh, trying to suggest was that, you know, um, even beyond 2045, if we're heavily reliant on wind and solar and battery energy storage charged by wind and solar, there may be times when we need to find other technologies that are able to um, meet the demand of, um, you know, the, the customer's energy demands. So that could be, for example, um, like the Schofield unit burning biofuel um, or some other technology that's not commercially viable today. Right. So you, you point to the intermittent, the, the shortcomings of intermittent power, and I understand that. But I mean, the world is changing where I'm a big fan of hydrogen, geothermal provides firm power. So those are just two opportunities for us to uh, really push in that direction and never have to rely on intermittent power and batteries to power our grid in the future. So you should be in the process of, of scaling down your current fossil fuel generating plants, correct? Correct. I mean, it's, I wasn't uh, trying to suggest that's the only solution. Um, you are correct that, you know, um, 
the geothermal offers a great re renewable resource um, that's uh, you know less prone to intermittencies. Um, you know, and hydrogen, I think that's something developing currently. Um, so those are all things that we we are looking at through our uh, planning and procurement processes. Okay. Good luck, Mr. Asano. We're relying on you. Members, any other questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. We're going to move on to uh, the next measure that is Senate Bill 932 relating to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. First on our testifiers list is Mike McCartney from DBED. Hi, I'm Chair uh, Hi, Georgia. Georgia Skinner, uh, Creative Industries Division. Uh, we stand on our testimony and request that you look at part two as the department has already uh, has a new realignment of duties within the department itself to address, I think, what your concerns are. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Georgia. We have Gwen Yamamoto Lau from GEMS. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. The authority stands on its written testimony in support and would like to underscore the importance of accessing federal funds to, which would enable us to provide clean energy finance statewide, including the County of Kauai. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, Scott Glenn from the State Energy Office. Hello, Chair. The Energy Office stands on its written testimony in support and available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glenn. Jay Griffin from the PUC. Uh, thank you, Chair. The PUC stands on our written testimony offering comments and available for questions too. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Jay. Uh, Craig Kirai from Budget and Finance has submit co submitted commentary. Dean Nishina from DCCA. Good afternoon. We stand on our written testimony offering comments available for questions, if any. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dean. Uh, Tom Yamachika from the Tax Foundation. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Tom Yamachika from the Tax Foundation. Uh, we've submitted written testimony. Um, we stand on that and are available for questions. Great, thank you, Tom. And Ted Bolin, uh, testifying on behalf of the Climate Protectors Coalition, has submitted testimony in support. Members, any questions of those who are online with us? I just have a quick question for uh, Gwen Lau. Hi, Gwen. Yes. I am in support of this uh, measure, but I'm just wondering, as we uh, sunset or remove the one agency and transfer the responsibilities to this new agency, is there going to be an additional uh, expenditures, or how does that match with, you know, right now we're trying to uh, minimize the size of government, right? Would this expand it? Would this minimize it? How, do, how could you tell us and give us a fair understanding in terms um, of number so of- Jason, and, is this in regard to the tax credits? Okay. Uh, section two. Yeah, there's a section two. Yes, okay. yes, and the replacement. Right, I, I actually our um, uh, creative industry has found a solution for the tax credit. So. Uh, we are re respectfully requesting that that um, it's a administration deleted? of the tax credit be deleted from the okay, scale. Okay, good. I didn't Thank realize you. that that's been deleted. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. That's okay. going to be a big secret later. Oh, we're sorry. Gonna, we're going to give you the part two. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Members, any further questions of those who are online? Okay. If not, we're going to move on to our next measure. That is Senate Bill 1237 regarding taxation. Uh, for solar technology. And uh, just before we started on this measure, there are a number of people who have uh, requested to Zoom testify. And as I repeat that, we have a 30 second time limit on everyone who's speaking. And please, if someone before you has said the same thing as you, um, forgive me, but I'm gonna cut you off. If you're gonna talk about how it's beneficial to you and your in the industry and the date. Um, once somebody says that, if you're going to be person number three that says the exact same thing, I'm going to cut you off uh, because all of us on this committee have had the t your testimony and have read through your, your testimony. So I ask that you, if uh, you want to speak, speak about something different from what someone before you has said. So we're going to go first with our tax director, Isaac Choi. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair members. Josh Michaels on behalf of the Director of Tax. Uh, we stand on our testimony and offering comments. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Scott Glenn from the Energy Office. 
afternoon, Chair. We stand on our written testimony offering comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glenn. Uh, Gwen Yamamoto Lau, James? We also stand on our testimony offering comments. Thank you. Uh, Tom Yamachika from the Tax Foundation. Uh, thank you, Chair. The Tax Foundation submitted written comments. We'll stand on those that are available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Yamachika. Ian Morikawa from uh, Hawaiian Electric. Is Ian Thank you. Oh, there you are, Ian. Wait, Ian, Ian, you're uh, muted. Remember? Oh, there, now you're unmuted. Now you're muted. Now you're unmuted. Sure. Yes, we stand on our uh, testimony available for comments. Thank you, Ian, for unmuting yourself. Uh, Sandy Wong from Tesla. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, we will stand on our written testimony in opposition available for questions. Certainly. And we have uh, Michael Munakata from Ulupono has submitted commentary. Joda Malinowski from Sierra Club in opposition. Brian Kealoha from the Hawaii Energy has submitted commentary. Paul Oram from Photon Engineering LLP. Is Paul with us? Hi, Senator. They are not present in the Zoom room at this time. Okay, sorry, we don't have Paul. Uh, Laura Breyer from Kauai Climate Action Coalition is in opposition. Tom Schmidt in opposition. He's from Island Solar Supply. Paul Spencer from Sun King is in opposition. Jason Marcos is in opposition. And uh, actually, I'm going to jump to the people who ha have expressed an interest to testify. And that next person is Tom Halmos from Photon Works Engineering. And I don't know if Tom is on, so I'm going to move on to Stephen Gates from Neighborhood Power, has submitted testimony opposition. Robert Harris from Hawaii PV Coalition has submitted testimony in opposition. Is Robert, oh, there I see Robert. Hi, Robert. Aloha, Chair. Aloha, Vice Chair. Good to see you. Um, you have a written testimony. Just make two quick points. One. The retroactive application of the bill is particularly problematic for somebody who may have invested already. Um, again, you have a lot of testimony in that. I won't belabor the point. Second, during the last recession, uh, this industry represented over 25% of the total construction industry, particularly coming out of COVID. This seems like a um, opportunity to sort of drive further employment and sort of help um, the economic recovery. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I will be available for any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Harris. We have uh, Neil Martin from Generic has submit, submitted testimony in opposition. We have online uh, Jody Mongat from Rising Sun Solar has submitted testimony in opposition. Matthias Bissau, Bissasso from Rising Sun Solar also has submitted testimony in opposition. Uh, Brian Gold from Hawaii Solar Energy Association. I see Brian. Hello, uh, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, we stand on our testimony. Uh, I'll just highlight one point that uh, was included in our testimony and a few others, and that's regarding the uh, average ratepayer bill reduction from 2011 to 2018. Um, and how that was driven by energy efficiency and increased scale of rooftop solar deployments. So uh, this bill will slow deployments and therefore um, that continued bill reduction. So thank you. Available for questions if there are any. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gold. And we have Susan Tayao, an individual who is not here, I don't think, um, but she has submitted testimony in opposition. And we have probably about two dozen more individuals all submitting testimony in opposition. Members, any questions for those who are online? No? Okay, good. We're going to move on to our last bill that is uh, relating to the Hawaii State Energy Office, Senate Bill 1360. Oh, sorry, did you have a question about the solar? So a tax credit? Yeah, uh, I just not understanding um, why, why are we going to um, try to reduce it on the amount for renewable now, um, unless I'm misunderstanding. 
that are coming from. Uh, we will talk about that in the when we convene for decision making. Okay. Okay. Uh, so members, any further questions for the solar tax credit bill before we move on? No? Okay. We're on to our last bill on this agenda. That is Senate Bill 1353 relating to the Hawaii State Energy Office. On our testifiers list is... Oh, I'm sorry. Scott Glenn from the State Energy Office. Aloha, Chair and Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We stand on our written comments, uh, written testimony offering comments. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And Louis Salaveria from San High, or actually Interjects Renewables, has submitted testimony support. Frederick Rydell from Hawaii Clean Power Alliance has submitted testimony in support. Members, would you like to ask uh, Mr. Glenn any questions about this measure? No? Okay. Members, we're going to go in uh, to recess and go into our little side room for recess. Yes, recess is piled back to work. So we are reconvening our EET committee, our three o'clock agenda for a lot of energy bills. The first bill is Senate Bill 929 relating to renewable energy. Uh, I've conferred with all of my members and we're gonna make the following amendments to this measure. Uh, we're taking into consideration uh, there are circumstances for HECO where the community might want to have some input, which might take it longer than the a shot clock allotted nine months. So we're going to allow that if, if there's a mutual agreement between HECO and the developer to like turn off the shot clock, then uh, we'll uh, keep it off. But the shot clock will still remain on for the PUC and uh, generally for uh, all other projects for HECO that do not have that mutual consent between developer and the utility. And we have technical non-substantive amendments. Members, any discussion? If not, Senator Mitsulucha, I vote yes. SB 929, Chair votes yes, aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Lee. Aye. Senator Rivera. Uh, reservations, please. Senator Favela. Aye. Measures adopted, Chair. Thank you, Mayor, uh, members. We're going to Senate Bill 930 relating to renewable energy. This is the bill that allows or mandates uh, the PUC to hire a traffic cop known as HERA, Hawaii Energy, I can never get the thing right. Energy, I should get it right. If I can read my own handwriting. Hawaii Electrical Reliability Administrator. So uh, this administrator will allow uh, the PUC, or well, actually not just the PUC, put all of the players together utility, PUC, the developers, the community, and figure out how to unclog some of the hangups we are having with getting these projects online sooner rather than later. So recommendation is to pass this measure with uh, just technical amendments. Members, any discussion? If not, Senator Misula, shall I vote yes? SB 930, Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Lee. Aye. Senator Rivera? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, measures adopted. Thank you, members. On to House Bill, excuse me, not House Bill, Senate Bill 931 relating to renewable energy. Um, I'm going to plug in some holes. Right now, there is no date for when this will take effect. But just for discussion purposes, we're going to put the date as December 31st, 2035. That'll make sure that. HECO has 10 years to ratchet down all of their fossil fuel burning plants. And I do want to make accommodations for them if they have to keep some of their fossil fuel burning plants up and running through just routine maintenance and repairs. So they can spend up to $2.5 million to uh, fix their current plants, but anything above that will not be allowed. We don't want them building out any new fossil generating uh, or uh, fossil fuel 
plants in the future. So uh, we we'll put in the accommodations that anything above $2.5 million is going to be prohibited. Um, and there's another PUCA in Section 2B, um, which has a no date, and we'll just align that with our uh, RPS and put that date as December 31st, 2045, because uh, I think we all want to see fossil fuel plants go away by that time um, as well. So those are the only changes to uh, Senate Bill 931. Members, any discussion? If not, Senator Misalu, should I vote yes? SB 931, Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye, Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Revere? Aye. Senator Fabella? Reservations. Measures adopted, Chair. Thank you. For Senate Bill 932, relating to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, this is a great bill for the GEMS program to go and chase mainly federal funds and really do even better things. Uh, with more resources than they do now. But there's a problem with part two, with the film tax credits, they uh, have the, the um, CID, uh, Creative Industries Division, has found another avenue in which to certify their film tax credits. So I'd like to offer amendment to take out part two and also make technical non-substantive amendments to Senate Bill 932. Members, any questions or discussion? If not, Senator B. Salucci, I vote yes. SB 932, Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye, Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Riviere? Aye. Senator Fabella? Aye. Motions adopted, or okay. measures adopted, Chair. Thank you. Um, members, we're on to Senate Bill 1237 relating to taxation. This is uh, uh, cutting in half all of the solar uh, tax credits. Um, as, um, we know the solar tax credit is the biggest burn in our state coffers. Uh, last count, it burned 30, uh, $64 million in our state coffers, and we know that uh, we gotta make sure the teachers and, and EMS and all of the important frontline folks don't get furloughed, and this is a means in which to uh, allow us to save uh, resources going out the door. We all acknowledge the importance of getting renewables, but we have some you know, front burner issues right now in trying to show up a $1.4 billion deficit, and this will certainly um, keep about $30 million or so dollars into our state coffers by cutting this tax credit in half. But I know that there is a problem with the retroactive nature of this bill as written, so I'd like to offer an amendment that makes the effective date January 1st, 2022. Members, any questions? Yes. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, um, I'm changing my vote from no to yes after your explanation, and um, thank you for the explanation. I really appreciate it. Wow, I should just keep on talking more. You can see this time with you. Thank you, Senator Fabella. I'll just um, chime in and, and just say I totally appreciate the circumstances the state's in and the changing nature of, of everything that we're facing this year. Um, my, only, my only worry in the long run is that we are... Um, while it's been around a long time, it is middle and low income folks also that can take advantage now of some of this technology, specifically because there are you know, additional benefits. So um, just about my reservations. Okay, certainly, thank you, Senator Lee. Okay, if not, um, the recommendation is to pass SB 1237 with amendments, and I vote yes. SB 1237, Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye. Um, Senator Lee with reservations? Is that what you said? Yes, please. Senator Rivera? Aye. Senator Fabella? Uh, Aye. Chair, no, uh, measures adopted. Thank you. Okay, members, we're on the last bill, that is Senate Bill 1353 relating to the Hawaii State Energy Office. Um, this is really a bill to kind of we focus that office on projects and getting projects out so we have renewables, of course, as well as economic development, jobs for our neighbors. Um, so I'd like to recommend that we pass this measure as is. Any discussion? If not, Senator Misalucho, I vote yes. SB 1353, Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye, Senator Lee. Aye. Senator Rivera? 
Aye. Senator Favella? Aye. This measure is adopted, and that's the last bill for this time. Woohoo! We made it through with high energy. Thank you, everyone, online and in person. We are adjourned. Uh, have a good weekend. You too. Oh, yeah. Go, Chiefs. Ha, ha, ha.